Thank you. Um, so first, just to explain a little bit about the structure of this, and I think it, it actually fits with the subject in shooting with people, which is a constant improv. Um, things are always changing. So based on the way that we did the last one, the way that this talk is going to be structured, um, and I say talk because I would like you guys to do some along with me, not just lecture, which is a bit different, is that it's set up in seven sections so that after each section, if you have questions for that one, you can ask at that point. Otherwise, trying to remember the question you had after the first five minutes, 95 minutes in is either impossible or you just can't see what you wrote down on your notebook in the dark. So that's, what, that's kind of the setup of it. Um, you know, like, uh, like the introduction said, this is going to be about photographing people. And it's a mixture of information based on my experience as an artist and experience as a photographer. So just so I have a, a sense as to what you guys are working on, how many people would consider themselves portrait photographers? OK, 10. Who is in the street photography idiom? A little bit more. What is everybody else? <laughs> you know, hired portraits, uh, headshots, okay. wedding, whatever. So between, there you go. Travel, OK. What do you guys find are some of the obstacles that you have with photographing people? And I'll just go to the people who answered. Well, language. Sometimes if I can't talk. OK. If you, if you don't speak the same language they speak. To ask them from, I, I mean, I can't a lot. A lot of hand gestures, smiling. becomes clear. Well, seeing something that you want to photograph, and maybe it's a little bit far away, I mean, people. And I feel weird about just obviously taking the picture, even if they may not see me, but other people see me, or they may see me mm -hmm. at a distance, and I can't talk to them. OK. We'll look at that. And one last one. Um, I, at this point in my life, I avoid children like the plague. <laughs> No. I just cut that out of my life completely. It's not only men. I would appreciate it. It's not only men. I feel the same way. I'd love to go to playgrounds, but I feel, you know, weird. I would say it's a tough arena. There are places I, you might see some children in this in the, uh, in the images that I've shot, and there are places that are easier and harder to do it, and. I would say, like almost as a rule of thumb, European cities, I don't shoot children, usually. Unless the parent is nearby and I can get kind of a nod of approval. If I happen to speak the language, which limits me to Italy and maybe some botched Spanish. But there are certain areas where it's not a bad idea to not take the picture. I know that there's a lot of conversation on the internet about photographing people and just, you know, how, you got to get the picture. I don't personally subscribe to this. I think the career of, of a photographer ideally has some longevity to it. That can become shortened depending on who you're photographing. So I would try to keep things as civil as possible. There are a few arenas where you can poke your head in and really jam a camera in. And if you're doing, you know, fashion runway, certain types of uh, reporting, war photography, yeah, you're sort of the lesser one. But on a playground, you're the standalone. And I think it is challenging for women. It's definitely more challenging for men. It's, uh, if you are a man from age like 18 to 75, see if you can get the permission of the parents first. So hopefully, what, I, what I'd like to do is look at the way in which I usually encourage people to shoot. And it's not instruct them. This is like, this is a set of solutions. There are more, but this is one that I found over the years starts to work so that shooting people, particularly in public spaces, 
is approachable and accessible because I, I, I wouldn't do this if I didn't think everybody could manage it. There's nothing, you know, this is not war photography. There is, like, there is nothing dangerous about it. There's nothing terribly complicated about it. It just takes a little getting used to and practicing some strategies kind of along the way. Um, we'll look at the flip side of this because a lot of this game is a patience game and this was the earlier shot in the series and we'll see what happens when they flip around. So the first thing I would really like you to ask yourself and I, I do this on a regular basis not because I you know, enjoy uh, you know, torturing myself but it's really, it's really useful to think about what are you doing? And what are your goals in taking pictures? Because without that, the photography game gets very hit and miss. There are a lot of things that you can get into, and your attention can easily get dispersed in a way that at the end, if somebody says, like, could you show me a portfolio of images? You say, like, well, I've got a catalog with 15,000 images, but I haven't made my final selections. I'm not quite sure what type of photographer I am. I don't know what kind of photography I want to do. So, Think about that. You know, maybe you know travel, and that's it. And like you've got it, and you're already set. But if not, if you're into particularly like street, street is this like black hole of a photographic land, with it just seems to eat up information, images, and photographers. And what I see coming out the back end is a very, very small amount of finished, successful, or desirable work. You know, it's not. Museums are not beating down any photographer's door for street photography. It's just not doing what it really could be. Um, and I think part of that is because its attention at the get-go gets a little scattered. Portrait photographers have a tendency to be a little more consolidated. You do headshots, you do weddings, you do events, and it has sort of a, a direction to it. Now, there is a one type of image that, and the next image is not, well, it's not that graphic, but um, it's a type of image that we're not going to talk about, right? This is Eddie Adams' picture from Saigon. The reason we're not going to talk about this is sort of twofold. One, I don't shoot war photography, so I don't have much to say about this arena. If I was up here giving you some level of expertise, it would be conjecture at best. It's not my arena. Two, is that this type of picture comes along, if you're lucky or unlucky, once in a lifetime. Eddie Adams didn't take two of these, he took one of them. And it wasn't something that he was particularly happy with or sort of proud of throughout the balance of his career, but it was an important picture. And there are certain pictures that they don't necessarily abide by any formal constraints, they don't have it wasn't necessarily a conceived image. It wasn't something that he was looking for. I mean, when Eddie talked about this picture, he was walking down the street just seeing what was going to happen following these guys. But the thing is, this may or may not happen in your photographic career. Something may jump out that regardless of everything in the picture, design, lighting, subjects, it doesn't matter. The content of the image is going to be so strong that it's going to be successful. It may happen. And if it does, the photo gods were smiling on you when it occurred. But if it doesn't, don't feel bad. Because I don't necessarily think that Eddie even needed this for his career. He went on to be a very successful you know, photographer. He was incredibly talented. And this set him off. But it's not something that we're going to really dive into. Because unlike painting, as unpredictable as painters would love to be, it's pretty predictable. I mean, it's you and the canvas. It's there. I mean, at best, you can stand across the room and throw something onto the canvas. And believe me, artists have tried everything from shooting things at canvases to throwing things. The chance element is a little different in photography. So if it happens, be sensitive to it and take, you know, take the opportunity. But we're not going to be able to necessarily plan on it, or for that matter, practice it. So as we look through things, we're going to look at some painting, a little bit of drawing, and some <laughs> photographs. And my sense is that 
we understand that portraiture is a long-standing tradition, right? I mean, as, as long as humans have been able to scrawl, scratch, or like smear pigment on some piece of earth, we've been trying to make representations of each other or the things around us. Street photography is a little newer, even within the world of photography, which is still pretty young in and of itself, say like 1860s forward for the most part. But we're gonna look at some paintings that, my feeling is that they are precursors or they would be street photography. So that hopefully when you leave, there's a new chunk of resources just outside of the internet that you'll be able to go to so that you can have artists help you out along the way in what you're working towards. And that's really how I use artists. Like people ask me like, what do you look at on the internet? I look at watches. I don't look much at camera and camera gear sites, image posting sites. I don't spend a lot of time there because most of it is like visual chatter. It's sort of worse than the news because it doesn't even have the ambition of putting something out with some message. It's just kind of chaos. So every now and again something will come past my screen that I'm interested in. But for the most part, I either look at photographers who I know and we sit down with each other and go over the work because it's a nice engaging thing. We can't chat with Van Gogh, you know, it's just, it, there's no, we don't have the option. We can read his book, but we can't talk to him. So what I encourage is that if you have the opportunity to step further away from the, the screen and have either a photographic community, a friend, a colleague who is into this, the more time I think you spend looking at images with people and in three dimensions. I mean like it would be great to have a bunch of prints here but something that comes up in workshops all the time when looking at photographs is like we'll look at things up there and call that a photograph. That is not a photograph. Anything on a screen isn't a picture. A, a photograph is like a, a thing that you can hold in your hand and that we don't really want to lose touch of that because it makes a big difference when you get it from there to hear and that tends to happen not on your own but with a bit of a community. So in my workshop and like Academy experience there are sort of ten things that I hear all the time and I know that when I started my artistic development I would have liked to have believed that it was unique and that the problems that I was experiencing were specific to my maturation as an artist. Turns out it was just like everybody else's. I might have been like a touch better than like a few of the kids at drawing, but generally speaking, we all go through kind of a similar process. And photography, no different than art, this is what I find comes up. Why didn't you get the picture? I didn't want to ruin the moment. Come on, who, anybody? This, like, just didn't want to get too close, didn't want them to see you. We're gonna look at some ways that we can kind of get around this as an idea. This is usually an excuse for an autofocus camera that I only had three seconds. You know, I don't torture myself with a Leica because I think it earns me any more credit. I happen to like manual focus. But don't let equipment stand in the way of your images. Um, this is one of my favorites. I see this, actually this showed up at some, in a version similar to this, in the comment stream from the last talk. I think, I think this is a bit of a cop-out in that photography is a game of luck and chance. Granted, we don't have control over the sunlight, what's going on, the people down the street, what's going to happen, the cars, the clouds, any number of things. But there's a reason that professional photographers make a career. It's because they're good at hedging their bets. And if they can get nine out of ten things in line for themselves, by the time you get to shooting, when the image comes through, you'll have some bad days. But more often than not, you will come back either from a project, from a trip, from a vacation, whatever you're doing, and you will have a solid body of images. And that's not, I mean, Cartier-Bresson probably caught the worst of it in terms of being a lucky photographer. And his response to it was that in everybody's lifetime, they will take 10 good pictures. Except in his case, I think he probably took somewhere closer to like 180 really good pictures. 
So I don't think luck and chance really resides, um, it doesn't reside in a place that's inaccessible. It may be like kind of the dusting on top of the cake. It's just like a little extra, but for the most part, the bulk, the heavy lifting of what we do is, is really kind of basic and you can get yourself into a position where it's not so chancy, you know? We've got to, if we're going to take pictures, we've got to be ready. I don't know how many times we go outside, we leave a workshop, we have a lecture, everybody's, yeah, I'm going to go take pictures, and we get out, and bags, like, the cameras are in the bags, the lens caps are on, I mean, nothing's going to happen. So, it seems a little silly, but be ready. This one, now, this one I've done, and if you're worried about not getting a, a good picture, you feel like you've had a dry spell, do yourself a favor, leave the camera at home. Because guaranteed, whatever you go out and see that day is going to be brilliant. So you'll get the photo gods back onto your side and then you can get the camera. You may miss the first one, but it will kind of, it'll get the ball rolling again. I spend a lot of time shooting 50 millimeter. I shoot some 35, but if you try and hyperfocal or scale focus with a 50, it doesn't really work. When I shoot, there's no mystery. You know, shooting the kids, shooting people, the camera's up against my face. I'm not trying to make it uh, a secret that I'm taking a picture. I don't think it really gives off the right vibe. I mean, like, Nobody really wants to feel like somebody is sneaking around them. And people can sense it. It's, I mean, it's very strange. It's a little esoteric. But like, they can just sense what you're up to. And I think if, you're, if you just know confidently that you're here to take pictures, some people might not want their pictures taken, which is fine. But for the other ones, if someone is going around with enough confidence that you're not really questioning what they're doing. You say, oh, they're fine. I don't know. I don't know what they're taking pictures of. Maybe it's me, maybe it's somebody else. But this, like, I had to shoot it from down here. I don't know how many subway pictures I see of, like, at a funny angle and there's a purse in the corner and, like, the door and the reflection just cuts out. Because it's really hard to take a picture if you're not seeing. This is a challenging photo to take. And it's not much different than this. I mean, you can practice it, but there are a lot of other things you can practice in your lifetime than hip shooting. So I, you know. It's not, you don't, you don't have to ban it from the repertoire, but maybe just, you know, buffer it back a little bit. Choose your mentors wisely. The people that you idolize, think about, like, do you want their career? Do you want to take their pictures? You know, I read it on so-and-so's website. Ask yourself, is so-and-so a photographer? Or like, are they a person who owns a camera and owns a website. You know, like, you don't go to your mechanic for medical advice. You know, kind of just find somebody who works for you. You know, I have some photographers who I mentor, but there's only so many people that I can physically get to. This is not my pitch for you all to come to a mentoring program. Not my thing. What I would encourage you to do is find someone, though, and be mindful as to where the information you're pulling particularly on the internet. Books are a little less dangerous because they have to go through a big filtration process and publishers and editors and things. So it gets a little more distilled. But things on the internet, just kind of, just buffer them a little bit. Does anybody know when this one comes up? This is when there's like that big advertisement in the background that you didn't really see. And then they say like, no, no, it's just like the way the scene looked. Reality, on its own, is not very interesting. If I were taking a picture this direction, B&H didn't like you guys. I've got like a little, I can see Felipe's head, that's about it. You know, there's, there's not really gonna be much of a picture. And capturing the reality of it, I don't, know, I don't necessarily know that it does anything. So that if there are things inside of a scene that you would prefer not to be there, you don't necessarily have to Photoshop them out. There is a lot that you can do this way. I see photographers, photographers should probably take like yoga classes before going shooting because you have to bend down. 
And you have to get you know, into these positions that aren't necessarily comfortable. And walking around like this all day so that you're at about eye level with somebody's chest, your thighs are gonna burn by the end of the day. So most people, what do they do? They take the camera and they go like this and they tip it. And then you get all these converging lines that fall down to the bottom. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. We have to be able to move. And there's an amazing amount of things that can be eliminated from a picture or included if you need them by just moving your head. You know, it's like a, this is a game that you can practice if you are bored at a dinner table, bored at church, bored at work, temple, whatever you go to, wherever you find your boredom, just look at the heads as you're watching people move and see if you can get clear views of all of them. And you don't need your camera, but you can just tell by moving slightly where you might have a shot and where you won't. And it's free. It's cheap, it's easy, it doesn't have any extra megapixels, the batteries don't run out, you have to feed the machine every now and again, but that's about it. It's pretty basic. I don't know how many times in a workshop somebody takes a picture and on the back of the screen they zoom in. What do I want to look at a detail for? What do you want to look at a detail for? If you wanted to look at a detail, you would have taken a picture of that. We want to not marvel about sharpness, resolution, clarity. These things, they're nice, it's great. I mean, I used to shoot film. If I wanted really high resolution, I had to shoot medium format or large format. It's nice now that I can shoot 35 millimeter digital and it's pretty close to that. I mean, I'm happy that it's there, but it's not too, it, it's not worth devoting that much time to. So if the sharpness of the image is really the selling point on it, it's fine, go through your exercises. I had a, a little story. I had a guy in a workshop in Bangkok and he gets all of his cameras from his brother. And the reason he does that is because his brother buys every new camera. <laughs> everything that comes out, he buys the top of the line of everything. And what does he do with this? He takes a picture of one statue in his house. That's it. It never leaves the house. He doesn't go out on the street, doesn't take a picture of his wife, his kids, nothing. Not even a sunset. All he shoots is this one statue. We can do that with a camera, and I'm sure Fuji, Leica, Nikon, Canon, they would be thrilled to death if all of us bought every single camera they made. They would be happy, but we won't really go in too much further to that today. This is the last one, and I think it's the last one, but it's also the most challenging because even if all of us are shooting people, we're gonna get a range of images that is enormous. I mean, people, ages, countries, ethnicities, occupations, environments, it's gonna be huge. And when you can get yourself focused on what you're shooting, it becomes a lot easier to find it instead of just meandering around. I mean, there are days, there are days where I will like wander around with absolutely no agenda to shoot. But I could never have built up a body of images that anybody would have ever hired me for just wandering. It's a part of the process and it's a nice way to clear your head and to try and let things come into play. But there's also something to really try and to distill what you're up to and what you're interested in. <clears throat> a lot of people come for photographic education because they think that they have a camera problem. They don't have the right lens. They don't have the right camera. They don't know the right lighting. They would like to use reflectors. They're not quite sure what to develop next. It's important to be honest with yourself when it comes to photographing people to find out whether you're dealing with a camera problem or a people problem. Can you talk to a stranger? Are you comfortable going up to anyone on the street and saying, can I take your picture? If you walk into a restaurant, are you the type of person who strikes up a conversation with the hostess or you just say, table for one, thank you, and that's the end of it. Because what I find is actually the biggest lump 
of obstacles for people photography has got nothing to do with photography. It has to do with dealing with people. And in order to deal with people better, I would recommend going to tea houses, bars, beaches, places where people are generally happy and social so that you can get really comfortable with people. And if you're in a profession where you don't, now say your day job, you don't interact with people a lot. And that may be the saving grace of it. You might say like, if I have to deal with another person, I'm going to kill myself. But when you go out and take pictures, it is going to be, it's going to hit eventually that you will need to interact with people at some level. And sometimes you'll find that if you don't speak the language, it's actually easier. In fact, it's a great place to start because all of your stumblings and stutterings, you know, I probably have another 70 minutes worth of dribble to kind of throw out there. It's easier if you're not speaking the same language because it's just the energy that you're giving off to them and like a smile will go a really long way. It's not that difficult. We had somebody in the Leica workshop a few weeks ago and uh, he said that, I have a terrible personality for photographing people, but I want to photograph people. And the easy suggestion was just smile, man. Just smile. It's a, it's, if you're like, <clears throat> nobody's going to go near you. Even with a camera. I mean, they're just, it's going to be, it puts people off. But people, you know, guys who are, I say guys and women, it's just the default. But people who are kind of soft and easy, with crowds, with groups of people, it becomes very easy. And if you're a little shy, go hang out with them. It's easy. I remember in, in, back in university, we used to play this fun little challenge where if we were out, a group of friends, what we would do is you would pick one person in the crowd. And you can do this with photography. This is not just for picking up girls at bars. You take somebody else, take somebody out in a crowd and say, go talk to that person. So all of your friends collectively choose somebody for you to go talk to. <laughs> now, inevitably, what do you do? You take your goofiest friend and the hottest girl that you can find and you set the two on each other. But it's amazing how many times they actually get on. And I think with photographers, you know, when I see photo groups, photo groups look like kind of non-menacing mobs coming down the street. <laughs> and they scare away every picture in their path. But if you can say, look, you talk to the guy in the red jacket over there, you take the girl in the green dress, you, the three kids over there, watch their parents are there, ask them first, but you go do that. When you're kind of forced to go and interact with the world on somebody else's account, a lot can really happen. It's one of the other advantages of having photography as a job, is that you don't have an option. You've got to come back with pictures. You can't come back and say, like, you know, it was a really bad day. There weren't many people to shoot, you know, I was in Central Park and it was, you know, it was like plus and minus, but I didn't really come away with anything. That's like, it's going to be the end of that working relationship. You kind of have to get something and, you know, there are creative ways to do it. So what we're going to do here is this, this is a, the sequence. We're going to have a, a problem that we've looked at. Three of the things that we just looked at in that list of 10 aren't even worth discussing. You know, the lens cap, got, like we got that, right? We don't have to go back over that one. But seven of them are worth really focusing on. So if there are only three seconds to take a photograph, how are you going to get a good picture of a person? What I recommend to people, don't chase pictures. Find yourself a cafe, find yourself a stool, a bench, a seesaw. Just sit down and you'll be amazed at how often pictures come to you. New York, how many people live in New York? Most of you. How many people are visiting? Any shortage of people to shoot here? <laughs> right? I mean, like, there's, there is an endless stream of actors from professional to amateur that are floating through the scene all the time. You don't need to move. You just find the right corner, find yourself a scene and some decent lighting, and you can just wait. And I think that that, when I see this kind of this thing, you know, Woody Allen was a writer, not a photographer, because this doesn't do anything for photographers. This like nervous, twitchy, runny thing that I see around, it doesn't do anything. You want to be kind of mellow, you grab a seat like this, you know. Step one, find a scene that works. And 
people might not show up all the time. Sometimes you'll set up a really good scene and guess who shows up? Nobody. And the photo gods just kind of laugh at you and you're seeing people walk around the scene. <laughs> they come in front of it, they duck down, you know, if they're in, if you're in Japan like they'll, you know, they'll be very polite and bow through your scenes. It ha I mean some places have, you know, have little instances that are problematic. But what you can do is find yourself a nice corner. If you live in New York, you've got to have a nice block somewhere near you. Everybody's got something where like, if you live over on the east side, sun comes up on your end, morning shots, they work on that side. I live on the west side, so I'm on the sunset side. And there are spots in Riverside Park that I know on any given day, I can just go, sit in a chair, and pictures will happen. So, to kind of look at what scenes are like and what things capture our attention with scenes, we're going to look at a few artists. This is M.C. Escher before he became famous, right? So he went wandering around Italy and was totally captivated by how vertical things were. Now this is a different type of verticality than we have in New York because in New York we're like this and the buildings go like that and we don't necessarily get up there in order to see it. Here in Italy, he's able to go up and down and move all around, but what we can see, and the, one of the things that I love about looking at artists is that if somebody's got a career that's 40, 50, 60, 70 years drawn out, you can really watch them develop and mature. You can see what they were interested in, what were the things that when they were younger they were too aggressive about, and you can watch all the elements level out by the time they move along in their life. And it gives you a sense of their, kind of their approach to things. So if you have a neighborhood, for example, you think about what, what is the character of your neighborhood? Take the people out for a second. Just think about like what is going on. You live in the West Village, you live in Flatiron, you live in Tribeca. What is it about that area, about the buildings, about the sidewalks? Because they're all different. They're not the same. Everything was built at a different time and as much as New York has tried to make aspects of the city uniform, and that's because it's easier for them to go around and fix things that are the same. When you've got cobblestone on one and asphalt on the other, it's a, you've got to send a different crew to do this. They haven't leveled the place yet. There are still regional differences, even in Manhattan, that you want to have a sense of. Because once you get a sense of what you're doing and what its character is, then you can start to really play with it. That's when things get a little more fun. And <clears throat> this is Piranese, and he was an Italian draftsman. To me, there is a striking similarity between Escher's approach and Piranese's, right? One slightly more exotic in its sense of physics and gravity, but generally speaking, these guys, they're both working in Italy, both overcome with the same environment. So that there will be commonalities in the way that we look at things, but everything they're doing here is kind of setting up a scene. The figures in this, yay big, right? They're not, this is not portraiture yet. And it's, the reason that I encourage people to photograph scenes is because buildings don't really move. It's easier to sort out the light on a doorway because it's, it's going to be the same. It may be cloudy, it may be sunny, but it's easier if you start with something simple and non-moving that you don't have to hike a hundred miles to do and get a sense of what that is. The odd thing that will occur is that one day you will be photographing that doorway and someone will walk out. <coughs> a click. There's your picture. You had it all set up. You're, the lighting's right, the composition's fine, you already had it set and you didn't even know anybody lived in that house. You thought it was abandoned, that's why you picked it. And then all of a sudden, that is when you take the picture. So when we kind of explore the way in which artists set scenes up, we can see that with Piranesi, he is dealing with something that is monumental. It's monumentally different than New York, but I think there's something in that that you could apply to New York City, whether you're down at the Brooklyn Bridge or looking, you know, looking in the subways, there is a commonality that you can draw from that will, I find, eventually kind of inspire a revelation about the thing that you're looking at. This is a picture of mine. And this is in southern Italy, in Matera. 
And having those images back in your head, and as you kind of educate your eye, you will start to recognize the little elements that are picked from all around the world, and you can start to make some sense of them. So that when you look at a scene, you can decide how you would like to convey that. So, in this instance, and I've, I don't know, walked it half a dozen times, I haven't quite found the right person. There's a guy who lives over on the right-hand side. He's got three dogs. He comes out a few times a day. But I haven't seen the picture just right. But I know it's there. And knowing that that's there, every time I return to the city, it's kind of easy to just skip down the street in the morning, take a look, who's out, you know. So it's, it's easy. It's not like, a, there's no guesswork. There's no changing. You can kind of build pictures over time. And it's why I really enjoy going back to places. I mean, I don't know, when you like to travel, do you typically go to the same place a few times or do you go around? How many times does this happen? Because I've, it's not that I always go back to the same place. But you find a place that you like and the time of day you're there, the time of year, you say like, ah, oh, this would be great, just not today. And it just doesn't work out. But if you're never gonna be back there, all of a sudden, you know, you're just pulling out your hair, trying to make something happen that doesn't occur. It's why photographing in your own neighborhood becomes easier, because you can see it all the time. But if you do travel, it's worth kind of making these mental notes as to how things will build up. This is here in New York, right? So uh, my girlfriend runs an exercise program, and I work out there. And I looked at that spot for like three years before I took the picture. And this is Bethesda Fountain at 72nd Street. I don't know, for most of the New Yorkers will know it. If you're from out of town, it may, I don't know, it may ring, ring a bell or not. But what I wanted to do was to take a picture of just the architecture. And in order to do that, I needed a day for it to snow. And winters have been plus and minus in terms of getting snow. But one morning, with the proper amount of energy, it snowed. This picture was taken at like 5.20, 5.30 in the morning. So with nobody out, nobody put any footprints in my snow, it was nice and clean and even. But it requires kind of knowing something about the place that you're photographing and being patient. I mean, two and a half, three years, is kind of a long time to wait. But now that I shot it, I'm done. I don't need to shoot it again. I waited for it, but I'm happy with it, so I'm not concerned about it. One figure coming down the stairs with their dog, would it have added something? Possibly. Could I go back and hunt it out? Absolutely. But in the meantime, I usually encourage you as you're working on photographing people is first just set your stages. So this is a project I was working on here in New York, photographing construction workers. I spent about a little over 10 years in construction, so this was my arena for a while. Um, and I, I found an interesting connection to the fact that aside from all of the technology that goes into buildings, this was going to be a medical facility, so this was a pretty high-tech building, we still make ladders out of wood. I mean, this is like no, no different than like the Assyrians. I mean, it's just, it's, there's a baseline of human function that kind of informs an image. Now, I was hoping somebody was going to go up the ladder. At that point, nobody did. I had the light, but nobody showed up. And I'm perfectly content with the way that it is. But knowing how those things functioned, I was able to wait for a scene where my good friend popped his head out over here and animated this scene. So that when you build from a scene with no people to a scene with people, it's a lot less overwhelming if the setting is done in your head. If you know where, where you want to be, where you want the light to be, it becomes, you're just waiting and then all of a sudden he pops his head out, click. It's really simple and it's why like in workshops people are usually kind of confused by the fact that I don't take a lot of pictures. I know some people get sort of reproached for doing, uh, doing workshops where they're photographing their project and you're like lucky to tag along. This <laughs> is not my approach. My thing is for you guys to shoot. And I think that the way you can start to work as a photographer is actually closer to a director. A director, like you've looked through the camera enough, you don't even need to see the thing. You can see the scene and just tell somebody how to shoot it. And like, you, if your vision is that clear, it becomes pretty easy to direct somebody through it. So you can, I mean, you can take somebody by the back of the collar and like 
bend them down, say, okay, ready, wait, wait, and then fire, and they've got it. And once you go through that motion once of seeing the scene and then having it animated by the people, I think it becomes a lot easier. And you know what you were asking before about photographing people and it being a little off-putting, there's an unspoken social contract, I think, which states if you are in the space first and somebody walks through, while you might not be entirely free and clear, you will run into a lot less problems than if you chase them down because they've walked through your scene. Not to say that somebody might not flip out and yell at you anyway. It may happen, but usually if you are waiting for a scene to develop and somebody goes through, you're free to pick who is involved and who is not. And that's why if you're sitting down, if you're in some stance that is less aggressive than this, you know, we don't want to fight our subjects. We don't want them to be that off put. But if you're hanging out and you're just on a wall and you're waiting and then all of a sudden somebody comes through and like, click, you've got your picture, you're off to the races. They don't know whether you're taking a picture of them. If they look over, you still usually have enough space where sometimes they'll look, you click. I'll sometimes do this. Just look back over their head. They'll look the other direction. They think you're photographing a bird. They don't know what millimeter lens is going on there. Like it's just, if somebody looks at you and you look past them, they generally think you're interested in something over there. And that's easy enough. Here was a wonderful little scene in Zurich. Nobody showed up. It was a day like today. It was raining. Couldn't, uh, you know, we, we couldn't quite get the right group of traffic to come through because it just, you know, it was a balmy day. And sometimes it happens. But being able to set this up and have it in your head, I believe, makes things a lot easier. I also find that it's, it's an interesting picture unto itself. The focus on people sometimes is too intense. There's a lot that can be said for the sensibility of a person based on the space they live in and the objects they surround themselves with. And you can tell, I mean, like, how Swiss is this? Come on, it's like this is a public space. Totally clean, perfectly organized. Heck, they're even light, they're, like the lighting is proper. I mean, it's just, it's such a Swiss moment. You couldn't go to Kerala, India and find that scene. It doesn't speak to that sensibility. This is also in Switzerland. So, in a short period of time, after conceding to the rain and heading to a museum, thinking about our good friend Escher, where things like to move up and down and left to right. I'm gonna be totally, this to me, in my set of images, this is like a B image, it's not an A image. And the reason I say that is that I wanted three elements. I saw the guy in the background, the old man tipping forward, right? I see him. And the woman wrapping around going up the stairs on the top, happy with her too. And the fella coming down the stairs took an extra two steps too quickly and we missed him. So we got two out of three. But if the whole thing is set up in advance, you can go, you can take this shot, I won't say anything, you go to the museum and you can camp out there forever. My guess is you won't be there forever. You'll probably be there for a day or two and you would get the perfect configuration of people that you would like in the way that you would like them because they don't always wear the outfits that you want. Sometimes the, you know, the one going up the stairs, if she's in a white dress, she blends into the ceiling. But it's, n it's not that hard. And I find that it's, it's simpler as an approach. Instead of chasing around people, chasing around scenes. Because the scenes have lighting and they have some level of animation, that they activate the people around them. I am not really a fan of this, and I've seen this in the, again in the street world, where you just find a weird looking person. And they say, oh look, that guy's got like tattoos. He looks weird, let's go take a picture of him. Or like, look, that guy's got like a mohawk. We should go do that. Or like, look at all the piercings that she has. Like, this is, not, this is a picture like this. Get out a 500 millimeter lens and just do it. Because it has nothing to do with the person, the context, or anything else that's occurring around them. Because I think people are a lot more interesting than just the funny clothes they wear. And usually in New York, the ones who wear the funny clothes are like, they're not that weird. They're kind of like trust fund babies just hanging out in the East Village and they put on their dirty clothes and like, they're not that interesting. You know, we saw like a punk kid down at Union Square and like, 
he had the hands of like a nine-year-old girl. I mean, he was, there was nothing rugged about him. You know, he probably went home and played his video games. So just the outfit that he had, he, you know, he wants his spikes and his mohawk and, you know, he's tough and what, it's nonsense. The weirdos on the street, whatever that means, usually are not that interesting and they won't yield a collection of images other than people who need a trip to the barber. That's really, you know, so just, I say let them be. What to shoot? A huge advantage that we have as a community and as a lineage is that we are not the first person to make a likeness of another person. There's an enormous amount of resources that are available to us. And guys like Da Vinci, they were into dissection. Me, I don't have the stomach for it. I like to know the way the human body works, but I'm not gonna take it apart. For artists who are really interested in anatomy, you can learn a lot <coughs> from their studies without having to go through all of the labor. And it's helpful to look at them because they found very useful solutions and they've distilled that which is visually important versus that which is sort of medically important because we only need that which is photographically important. There are certain aspects of the human body that if you photograph on the street, don't register. You know, the way in which a hair follicle works might be interesting, but you're not gonna see it unless you do the whole zoom in thing. But we tried, you know, we're gonna stay away from that one. <laughs> so we're gonna look at some people, our artists, who approached a human subject matter. When I was putting this uh, talk together, something, some school thing clicked for me. Remember when we were younger in school and you would get textbooks? And the textbooks had no answers, right? There were questions, but like there were no answers. There was like a point at school that you got to where all of a sudden they start putting the answers in the back because they don't care. They say, here's the answer. We're interested in how you get there. And the, the way that I prefer to teach this type of material is I'd rather give you the answers because all the interesting stuff happens afterwards. If you have to sort of earn the answers, I know some people they work very hard and very long to achieve what they achieved and you know, we all have our sufferings. But there's no value in me suffering and then you suffering and wasting another 20 years of your time before you get to it. I'd rather just tell you, look, this is a solution. Try it out. You can shoot it one way, you can stage it, you can not stage it be sort of open about the learning process. I think that's why uh, for artists when they're making studies and sketchbooks and things like they're all, it's all a learning process and that's when they will make copies of other artists because they're trying to learn all the way through. The other easy thing about um, working with master painters in contrast to working with photographers is it's easier to get their stuff. At the Met, I think you can give like a nickel. I mean, you could probably give a penny, but it's pay as you will. You go to MoMA, I think it's like a $20 tattoo to just walk in the door. I mean, <laughs> contemporary people need to make a contemporary living. Rembrandt's estate is dissolved, so it doesn't matter. You can learn at it, you can pick over it, you can get a book, you can look on the internet. There's a thousand different ways that you can study it, but it's cheap and it's easy and there's a lot of it and it's already been distilled so that you can, you don't have to mess around with too many uh, mishaps. You know, you can go, I mean, even if you plunk yourself in Barnes and Noble, they've done enough of a distilling process that you can say like, oh, well, at least every fifth title is actually an artist that I should probably look at. Or I could learn something from looking at them. The last point about anatomy, you know, we're not gonna go into dissection here, but if we're talking about photography, of people as a component, it kind of helps to get a sense as to what they're made of and like what parts are relevant, what are good views of them, what are bad views of them, what that even means. What does a good view and a bad view of something really mean? Now, Da Vinci, he studied it. And to turn, to turn this, you know, these scribbles into something that makes sense to you, everybody, anybody wants to play along and try this. Take your thumb, put it under your chin, 
put your index finger under your nose, right? That space, it's going to be a little different on everybody, but that is the same space that exists from the underside of your nose to the ridge of your brow. And depending on your level of lifetime stress, will get you up to your hairline. The line is slowly creeping backward. There is a small little spot that exists at the top, but that's what he's illustrating there. We can see those, and then that little space at the top is usually one eyeball tipped on its head. The other one is that the eyes reside in the middle of the head, half-half. <coughs> I mean, when we, when we think about photographic composition and we get into rule of thirds, halves, quarters, root four, all of these things, what are they derived from? They're derived from artists who are studying nature. And they're looking at a human face and saying like, oh, well, a human face you could split into thirds or you could split it into halves. So it becomes a parallel harmonic conversation that you can have with the image and with its subject. But it's useful, I think, if you could walk away with anything in this one, just know that the eyes are halfway in the middle of the head. Because as you tip back, it will foreshorten or extend a portion of the head, which is why, as you're going up and down, it will affect the way somebody's head looks. If you shoot them more from above and they end up looking like they have a big egg head, or you're shooting them from below and they look like they have the jaw of a boxer. I mean, like, it's all going to affect it. And that's all the study that you would need to do. You don't have to take this head apart. A lot of the lessons that artists leave in paintings, they never show up on those cards on the side of the museum. It'd be great if they did. They give you a bunch of biographical information, which is comprised of where they're born, which nobody ever remembers, and the dates, which are even harder to remember as you go through the entire museum, and then a little snippet about you know, some obscure uh, biographical aspect, which may or may not be relevant to it. But something that would come into this, and you could understand from reading Da Vinci, because Da Vinci wrote a lot. They, like, not all artists leave traces as to what they were doing. They leave traces and images. So if you can decipher the images, it's easy to get. But if you can't, then you kind of need somebody to explain them to you. But once you see them, they're yours. For the portrait work, and this is something you've seen ever since you, know, you had your picture taken in grade school. When the chest and the head face one direction, you know where you see this? In churches. Dead saints in statues. Because when the head and the chest point the same direction, you're dealing with a dead person. They're not moving, they're not alive. He wants Mona Lisa to be alive, turns the chest in one direction, the head in the other. The other thing that you can kind of take away from taking a portrait, whether it's a candid portrait or it's a arranged, complicit portrait, is that you want to include hands in an image. You know, I have a whole uh, talk that I do on hands alone because they're important. And Da Vinci studied those hands for a very long time until he got them the way that he wanted them. And the gestures of the hands were coded in a way that they also have certain meanings. And they reveal something about the individual. Those, if, you know, if we look at this, and you cover the top of the picture, because I'm sure you've seen the whole the, the layover with Da Vinci's head, and maybe that's a picture of Da Vinci and Dan Brown and the Da Vinci coat. Forget all of, We're not going to get into that. <laughs> if you look at the bottom of that, those are the hands of a woman. That's someone who has paid attention to what makes a woman's hands different from a man's hands. She was not a mason. And by that, I don't mean the mystical one. I mean the guy who works with mortar and brick. So if you take that out of a picture, you eliminate an element of it that kind of adds something to the image. I don't know how many times I see portraits and I see like hands cropped out and like cut behind and they look like they're maimed, but you know, you know the person. Turns out they have five fingers. You just don't see them in the picture. Now, why do I show you this? Piero della Francesca made this painting. Batista Sforza on the left-hand side she is dead. She was dead when the painting was made, and that's the best they could do for her. Her husband, was, he, he decided to paint him on this side because the other side, he didn't have an eye. He lost, he lost it in, uh, in a battle. So he took the best sides in, you know, looks like he still lost a notch out of his nose too, and 
he did the best that he could with what he was given. But we would like something a little more like this. Della Francesca was, we'll see in the next picture, was crafty, um, but I think da Vinci took it a little bit further. So this is his picture, The Resurrection in San Sepulcro. Um, interesting thing about this painting is it was, buried, it was buried behind plaster for almost 200 years. They plastered over it. I guess they looked at it and they said, mm, we don't like it too much, we're just gonna cover it up. And then some academics figured out that it's gotta be back there and they chiseled it down and they found it. Now, I know the picture here is a little small, but does anybody notice something weird about this picture? There's something very important that's missing here. And it's to Della Francesca's credit that it's not immediately recognizable. And it has nothing to do with the Christ figure at the top. Any takers? Yeah? There's no light, really. Well, the light's a little flat. Yeah. We'll say they had to yank it out from behind the plaster, so we'll give them a little break on that one. But one thing that's missing, this guy's got no legs. None. There's nothing from the waist down. He lands here. Those are his legs. It's not there. So when I say, like, in terms of Photoshop and manipulating things, this is my pedigree. This is where I come from. And we mess with things a lot. And in a way that in most cases, it's not necessarily perceptible. Because like the magic tricks, if you do them well, even to the people who know what's going on, nobody's going to pick up on them. But I show it in contrast to this one because this is a little lifeless. This was sort of the pay the bills work. This was a little more compelling and we can see a nice level of figure variety in all the figures at the bottom. We're getting good views of the heads and the Christ figure at the top who is, in spite of the flat lighting, is slightly better lighting than what's going on in the rest of his comrades. <coughs> Unfortunately, this thing is falling off the wall, but it's something worth revisiting because there's no way that I can do it justice in here. But if you go through and think about what da Vinci started with looking at, looking at particular views of the human head and the role of hands in images, and not getting into the mysticism about it, The Last Supper is worth looking at in detail because all of the gestures are designed and assembled in a manner that they fit with the narrative. Now, are we going to be able to go out in 34th Street and do this? No. I have no pretense of finding the Last Supper on the street. It's not going to happen. This bar is a little higher for what we're trying to do. But if you can look at some of those figures and notice some of those gestures, my guess is you could do it with one person. I mean, you could probably watch your mother-in-law at, at dinner and say, like, yep, she probably did one of those. And it might actually have a meaning, too. And as you build from one to two to three to four, I think you'll be amazed with how much you will actually be able to capture. It won't happen all at once, and that's why, you know, like I said, you start with a setting, not even the person. When you start with a person, you'll start with one. But you go back to these references, because these guys laid out a really good blueprint that you can kind of touch off of and see what, you know, where you stand. This is John Singer Sargent. And talk about an exercise in portrait painting. Every single view of every head in this piece is deliberate. There's only five views. There's a frontal, a three-quarter, a profile left, a profile right, and that's it. Everybody's got a good view, because you can't give somebody a bad view in a portrait. They get mad. There's, somebody's paying for it, so you have to get something good. You try going down to San Gennaro in Little Italy and try finding this in the scene of people lined up getting their Zeppelis. Three. Start with three. You might get three. You take just the guys on the left-hand side, you go behind the Zeppeli thing, and you look in all of the, you know, the fiending foaming mouths as they're waiting for their powdered sugar to come across in that white paper bag. <laughs> Those ones you can get. As you start getting out and you know, you get into 28, uh, 21, 24, you get to wide angle and you have, you've got a lot more to deal with, it's gonna become a lot more challenging. Take on a challenge by all means. But you might be able to mitigate the margin of error with a smaller number. And this is certainly something 
that the painter has a distinct advantage over the photographer, but it's useful to kind of have in the back of the head. Renoir, this is kind of like street photography. This is pretty much you and your friends hanging out, having a few too many cocktails on a summer day. But as we look through this, we can see that the views of the people are all very deliberate. And everything, this doesn't have a laser on it, does it? No. Everything keys off of this figure. This figure swings around, hits the lapel on this guy, and swings back. And this arabesque fans out the entire way and informs and unifies the whole picture. When you look at a group of people and you don't know how to shoot them, by studying artists who have organized groups of people in a way that looks, I would say, totally natural, but completely organized, you could find that scene. You know, start yourself off easy. And you find a scene like that. And if you just remember, that's what he did, I'm gonna try and do that, and you work towards it. Don't worry, you won't ever copy Renoir. It won't happen. Mm -hmm. It's just, it will become, it's, it'll be different. It may be informed by him, but you're not gonna run to a plagiarism thing where people are gonna say like, well, looks a little, you know, a little too French for me, I don't think that works, yeah? Oh, well, it's, maybe the next one. Maybe next one, thank you. <laughs> Remember the dead person, right? This is Degas and his little friend who had too much absinthe and is nearly catatonic at the table. This is not a good day. And if you catch somebody at a cafe and you want to express the fact that they're hung over dead at the table, head and the chest the same direction, you're in business. Her friend to the right, he's still alive and kicking from last night. She had a much rougher run. But you see, like, you could find this. If we went out and everybody said, like, I'm going to take a picture of two people sitting at a cafe next to each other, not engaging, completely manageable. And you look at the distance, he's not in their face. I mean, we could call that somewhere between 50 and 40 millimeters at the table across the way. I mean, that's not a, it's not a huge view. It wouldn't be too difficult to deal with, but I think it, gives us a little bit of an approach as to how things can occur and that we also don't need to be right on top of people all the time because the portrait photographers get this because they don't take nostril shots of their subjects but street photographers don't they do this ah and like you know the underside of somebody's chin their nose these things are not the better sides of a human being and you know we might like to find some other alternatives to shooting in that manner Another easy way to start, something that's not moving. Not quite a building, but you can use a plaster cast. You can practice lighting it, you can spin it around, and you can see where you would like to be in terms of photographing it. Because if you just go to photographing living people, this is like, right, I'm 33, which right now a lot of my friends are, they're having babies and they're taking pictures for the first time. The last thing you want to practice on is a child running around. They have zero attention span, almost no level of cooperation, and it's like constant mutiny. Starting with that, they say like, I can't get any good pictures of my kids. <laughs> yes, of course, it's a child. It's really difficult. They move around and also, they're way down at the ground, so you're rolling around the entire time. Make life easier. This is what I say, like hedge your bets. This is an easy way to do it, because if you can go in you can go into the Met and go into the Greek and Roman wing. There's about 200 statues just like this. And you can photograph them with the light in the way that you want them. You can see the ones that don't have light the way that you would like it to be. And you can get used to landing somebody in the frame. Bang, bang, bang. Chances are, actually, you spend enough time doing that, somebody at the museum will ask for you to take their portrait. And now, all of a sudden, you've got your living subject. This is from a series I worked on in Japan. I'm a big fan of doing things like one step at a time because it's manageable. And when you go from the head and the hands, you practice each one separately because you do it 20 times, hands, 20 times, head, 20 times. When you have to put the two together, now all of a sudden it's a lot easier to put them 
into one image. Hands, head, hands, head. And make sure the head turns if you would like them alive. The, the dead thing we can also do, but just remember. And this is a bit of uh, something that you can do if you're shooting somebody. Uh, say you ask, say you luck out and you find somebody on the street you don't know who would like to have their picture taken. <coughs> you ask them to take their picture and what do they do? They give you their best military stance so proud and stiff that it is completely lifeless. How are you going to get them from this to that? Two ways. If you are tall or you are short in relationship to them, you have two options you can do. I'll do the tall one because these guys are sitting. If you photograph somebody and you start out at eye level and they're facing you, you can kind of take advantage of the fact that as humans, we're a little lazy. We'd like to be models, but we don't want to do that much work. As you take pictures, and you say you burn two or three images, just to get them not used to listening, you know, not so freaked out by the shutter. As you start to walk around, what a person will usually do as you're talking to them is they look at you, and they turn. And you can turn and stand up, and they will do like this. Their head will turn up, up to the right-hand side or up to the left-hand side. Because they will turn like this as far as they can go until they turn their shoulders. When they turn their shoulders, you reset and swing back the other way. But all of a sudden, you can introduce a lot of movement into people. If you see somebody on a bench that you want to take a picture of, don't stand in front of them. Sit next to them because they've got to turn over to you. That little turn and activity will save you the mugshot because this one Military, death, and police, these are not the pictures we want to be taking. Nobody is going to look at your picture and say, like, that's the best picture of me that looks like when I was in San Quentin. It's, you know, <laughs> this is not what we're going for. I mean, you see the old Sinatra pictures of him with the, you know, down on West 4th Street. We don't want to do the police lineup. Now, when you can swing them all together, it's, it becomes a lot easier. And as you photograph people, you will notice that the people you're photographing, they have a certain character about them. It's probably what got you over to photograph them in the first place. There was something about them, aside from that mohawk, that really like caught your attention and you wanted to go see what they were up to. And people who are in certain trades and certain professions, they do things with their hands in a certain way. They handle the tools of their trade in a manner that like you might even try to do it with your hands like my hands don't even do that I don't even know how they like how they work like that and a barber a seamstress a, a metal smith like they're all gonna work very differently and you can get a sense of it if you're looking for it there's a difference between looking at a photograph that has a nice ingredient in it and looking at something that is really a photograph this is a turkey this is a painting of a turkey. This is a piece of art. This is John Kern, he's a contemporary painter. We see the difference. Sometimes we might find nice elements inside of our pictures, but because as photographers, we can't go back and rework everything. Everything's gotta be done in one shot. We need all of these things to be ironed out by the time we hit the shutter. Otherwise, we end up in loads and loads of post-production. But we want to be able to distinguish between that which is a nice element that you caught in the picture or whether you really have a picture. This I took in Venice. You know, they might not, you know, this doesn't show up on the, on the labels for octopus, right? This is not how they market it. This to me is a photograph of a pile of octo octopi, is that right? Yeah. You recognize anything from street photography in this? Is this the aspiration of every street photographer to have that one foot out, that like walking pose? This is so old it's boring. I mean, it, it's completely two-dimensional. It's, it's the best the Egyptians had at the time, and you can find statues that do just the same thing. But if you want this in a photograph, I mean, I read 
I see articles and articles. Did you see this article on, you know, catching movement and finding the triangle in the leg? It's like, yeah, I saw it in Egypt. It's been sitting there for 5,000 years. There's not much beyond that. It's a good start. It's a nice element. It's not a picture, though. It's not a thing unto itself. No image. It's just, this is a nice element. Nothing's happened. I don't consider this a finished picture. It's just, it's a picture I took as a demonstration for setting a stage. You can, I'm sure you can just look at this and figure out where you want people to be. It, it just, it clicks. If the scene is cleaned up enough, you get all the junk out, you know exactly where the activity should really come from. So here's a sequence so that, uh, give you a little kind of glimpse into the way in which I look at things. I take students to the Met often because we can take pictures easily. You're allowed to. People are fine with it because they're in the museum. They're taking pictures too. You, take pic you can't have somebody with a camera yell at you for taking a picture of them. It doesn't work. I mean, they've got to be okay with it. They did it to you. You do it to them. It's fine. You just keep going on. It's a nice and easy place to shoot and it's a simple place to practice because everybody needs like a basketball court or a soccer field. You just running out on the streets all the time gets a bit tiring. Yeah, sometimes it rains, the lighting's consistent. So if you want to work on something, you can build it up inside of a place. For all the New Yorkers, which looked like, I don't know, 80% of the crowd, this is a sort of easy one to do. So this one, not working. I was hoping he would come together. Didn't really happen. That one worked for me. Now, to me, it's a funny joke because we remember our Egyptian relief from the back and now we've done a live version of it. Does that sequence make sense? Does it, it's like clear like why, I, I've seen something like this on Flickr. It's not a picture. You know, it's, it's a start. You know, you, you, you put the flower in the bowl with the egg, but there isn't anything happening yet. It still needs some more work. And you try, you try off the back end of it, you wait off the front end of it, and there's a lot that you can play with to make that sort of come together. Here's another one. Nice picture, not really a finished image. It's a good element. Could have used somebody else to show up, but nobody did. This is another one for me. Useful elements. The synchronization of the parents and the kids all together in front of the church. I mean, what could make the church happier than a, you know, a family? And, I mean, this is, this is what the church goes for. It's their thing. It's still not a picture to me. It's good practice, and it's useful, I think, if you can have these elements that you can practice over and over and over again, because then when they happen, like, for real, or with something that is really impactful, you've already got all this stuff down in your head. Like fish in a barrel. <laughs> what happens now, this picture is not possible now, because the Met, for whatever reason, laser pointer, they put a kiosk here, an information kiosk, which ruins the shot. So when you go to the Met, let them know that that thing should move because you want to take that picture. There's a huge variety of things that can go on. I had it, there was a kid who kind of ran up with his mother. I mean, you could have somebody playing off the foot on the bottom. I mean, there's a lot of options. And this hallway, if you've been in the American Sculpture Wing, this is at one end of it. So this guy coming down, I had, pff, I don't know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds of watching him. Do, 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 all, I mean, all the way down. And when I took the pic, I don't know why he looked up at that. I, I have no idea. That's sort of like, if you're ready, it's easier to be here and then just go like this than to run yourself all the way down the museum chasing this guy. He's going to think you're a psychopath and probably run the other direction. This is the same church as that, one year later. Like I said, I go back to places to see what happens. There's odd collection here. There's actually a bunch of kids practicing for a fashion show. It seemed so strange to me though, with them all laid out in front of the church and such a bizarre setting. I didn't know uh, churches hosted fashion shows. It seemed completely uh, antithetical to what they're usually up to, but for whatever reason, it worked. And you know, I, what I look for in a scene with a number of people, 
you would like figure variety. You would like each figure to be doing something different and something clear, clear in it. When the activity gets really deformed and strange and people, you can't quite tell what they're up to, you get back to the Della Francesca where if they're missing legs and arms, like it's not really, it's not really a shot. So you want to get a, you know, a, an image that has a certain level of clarity. Now for the question about releases, and we'll see, because this is going to go on YouTube, she has my card, not her, but the woman who was in charge of it. And I, I asked if we could take some pictures because they're not all 18. There's some are like 16, 17 or something. So she said she didn't want to get in trouble for it. And I said, if it's a problem, I'll, you know, you write me and I, you know, I won't, uh, it won't be up on a website or anything like that. Um, but this is how I sort of manage it. Instead of waiting sometimes for somebody to ask like what you're up to, you just find whoever's in charge and just say like, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing, can I take some, a few pictures? And they say, yes or no. I mean, I heard a story uh, by Bruce Davidson, he used to carry a little book, like a little like five by five book. And he had a guy who you know, sat down in the train, and the guy said, you know, don't take my picture. No, 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 I don't take pictures of people without asking. Shows in the book, looks at the book. You're pretty good, you can take my picture. <laughs> You know, carry a business card, make a business card, just your name, photographer. It doesn't have to say your name, photographer, National Geographic. It doesn't, they don't ask if you're a good photographer, they just want to know if you're a photographer <laughs> instead of like a pedophile or a pervert or any of the other options that are going through their head. If you can just diffuse all of that and say what you're up to, you're cut, usually you're free, you're in good shape. When mistakes happen in scenes, there are a lot of things we can do to avoid them. This is a big chunk of images, so I'm going to go through it a little quickly, but you can revisit this on the computer or in a book of the Sistine Chapel to get it. <clears throat> We're going to look at Michelangelo, who went down to Rome to do the Sistine Chapel, right? Now, he didn't want to do this. He wanted to go make a tomb for Julius the, Pope Julius II. Um, but Bramante, a competing architect, said, forget that. He had the Pope's here. He said, have Mike do the ceiling. I don't want to do it. So he sets Michelangelo to task on this. And he kicks and screams, I'm not a painter. I don't want to do this. I'm a sculptor. Goes back to Florence. The Medici say, like, look, the Pope's going to invade us to get you. We don't want to go to war for this. Could you go down there and paint that thing and just get out of here and like deal with this yourself? So, fine. Now there's something that is very distinct about the approach that was used in this. And that was, he painted it in halves. Because they didn't have, he had the budget for the scaffolding and the ropes to do half the ceiling at a time. So he did half and then he came down let out a few expletives because something went horribly wrong and then he fixed it in the fifth panel and transitioned the rest of the way. The problem that occurs, and we'll look at it in individual panels, he started down here with Noah, drunken Noah, Noah and the flood, until we get to about Adam and Eve getting expelled from Eden. Now, there's like 30 figures in that panel you can't see any of them because they're too small. And you want to think about when you take a photograph, what's the carrying power of your subject? Because if your viewing distance is 80 feet and you've got 30 figures, nobody can see any of them. So what he did is he painted half of them and we'll see this is where he comes from. This is, you know, you view this sculpture right here. It's this big, it's tiny. Drunk in Noah, we're going to just see this progression. Look at how tiny those figures are. He's up there killing himself, doing figures that nobody's going to see. Crowded. Starts to loosen up a little bit. Further, down to three figures. Now he really finds his stride. And this took him getting at a distance from his own work. I mean, in the, in the realms of greats, he sits up there, I don't know, top ten, whichever way you skin it. And he looked at his work, stared up at the ceiling. This is not happening. I can't see these guys. 
So we have to be able to make these types of adjustments. And like when you're photographing in a place like New York, there might be somebody good in the scene. I mean, no one's going to deny that the drunken Noah isn't an important biblical figure. But unfortunately, he doesn't work so well in this scene. And notice he also, the, the flanks of the Sistine Chapel were painted towards the end. I mean, the, the power and the consolidation of the figures really grows as he's learning from his own process. Because when we work in this, we want to make new mistakes. We don't want to make the same mistakes. We want to build and develop one figure, two figures and three angels, one figure, right? Now you can see this. You go home and you study this and you'll, I mean, uh, Ross King wrote Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling, which is probably the easiest and best read on the history of this thing. But it's, it's really, it's, a, it's a, an error that he corrected. He just said, like, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to fix this and make sure that this thing has some carrying power to it. Later, this is Poussin. And, you know, whether you're doing studies or you're doing finished paintings, there are some things that you can work out in advance so that the picture does have some carrying power and all the figures read clearly. You try and take a five-person picture on a subway where everybody's clear and there's not like an advertisement cutting. I mean, like, this is a viable challenge. But if you have this in your brain when you're looking for it and you look across the subway platform, you might be able to find kind of a clear group to work with. Caravaggio, I mean, this is... You know, it's a uh, Roman street scene. You know, the guy in the middle with the little feather, you know, this is his assistant. You know. So it's, they would have, he got a lot of grief because people actually recognized other people in the paintings and didn't like this. He had a few commissions that were rejected. He had to do over again. This was a young girl that we didn't shoot in the 17th century, but she was shot, photographed in a workshop. And this was, who's been to Venice? Right? They, they try and get you to go to the, the opera and the, the classical music performances. And the kids at Cafoscari, the university, they're out, you know, kind of peddling these things. And Ariana was really nice and, you know, one of the guys was, wanted to do some portrait work, was really rather shy, didn't speak any Italian, mine is a touch better than his. So we kind of made this arrangement and, you know, I took a picture on the back end of it. But the same thing, the pictures before, she's sort of like dead in. And I just kept walking around and around until three pictures later, we got something that was serviceable. Here's our good friends, the Masons. And this is what <laughs> happened. <laughs> you just kind of, you know, you hang out, they don't care, they're on break, they're looking at you. They're like, they're yeah. <laughs> it's all, everything is fine in this scene. This is the other lot. And, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm waiting for him coming down the street. I have the picture without him in it, and it's missing. And I'm just connecting all the heads on one arabesque. So there are these simple things that you can do. If you travel with a wife, girlfriend, husband, boyfriend, partner, use somebody to spot the bus coming down the road. It's helpful. Length of the career, we remember, is useful. This one we get a lot. We don't want to ruin the moment. There are a lot of moments that have been captured so that if we study a little bit about them, it becomes a little easier to see how they come about. There are a lot of things I read on the internet that say take pictures in your backyard. It's great, useful, but if it's balanced with travel and if you have the means and the ability, I would encourage you to do it because when you get out of your regular environment, all of the things that you're sort of used to identifying with yourself, they kind of disappear because everybody in that new environment, they don't know you for anything. They know you for the person you showed up as yesterday. And I believe getting into that space can be really helpful to kind of experience the range of cultures, of people, of temperaments. This painting by Pierce of an Arab jeweler. Street, I mean, this looked like street work. Pretty simple. I mean, like, you know, I don't know, F4 maybe, you know, ISO 800. But it's, you know, it's kind of, this is in, it's in this arena. And 
Painters have been traveling to exotic places for a very long time. It's been, you know, we're interested in other people. You say like, oh, I've got a house, you've got a house. What do you do in your house? I want to come check that out. It's the whole photographer's, you know, motivation. Making more jewelry. I mean, it's just, it's just you could go find this for sure. This is Herbert Ponting in Antarctica, you know. Some processes may be a little slower. If you like working in larger formats, medium format, tripod stuff, there are certain pictures that lend themselves to that. You know, this is another tripod shot. I'm sure he asked this, the rest of the crew guys, go stand out there at the end so that we can get a sense of scale. But working, if you work all the time with people, it's really not a big deal to get them in more of your pictures. It's really just something that becomes very natural because they're around all the time. And there are the ones who are around who you know, and then there are ones who are around who you don't know. But that gets all mixed up because you're just used to chatting with everybody as best you can. This is John Singer Sargent in North Africa, right? You just see a quick impression of what is really essential about the environment. What is, what is the quick grab that he doesn't have time to mull over, you know, on end? Here he is again. I mean, these are, they're almost like photographs. And it's not the photographic rendering, it's just the capture of it. And he's looking for the clean gestures, the simplicity of it, and it allows him to go from, this is the same guy who did the picture with all the officers, right? To go from this in a watercolor to that in an oil painting requires a little bit of a buildup. Here's a more finished version that he was working on. This is one of his watercolors from Venice. I actually found this after I took this picture, but apparently there's a similar sensibility that you get when you look at a gondola. They just sweep forward and back, and when you can find something doing that, it kind of, you know, it, it lends something to the subject matter, and then, yeah, there. Ah, okay. Um, you know, I had the option of shooting without the guy, but I prefer the scale, that you get a sense. These gondolas, actually, the way that they're painted, they, to me, they read very large. Gondolas aren't really that big, but again, Photoshop, you know, the painter's world, they can do whatever they want. Nobody's there to attest to it afterwards. <coughs> this guy I met on their Independence Day in the South Pacific in Tana. Didn't speak any language in common with him. Yeah, sure. Okay, picture, look, smile, everybody's happy. Send the packet back to the South Pacific, they get their copy, I have mine, everyone's happy about it. Another way to shoot people that isn't very difficult, shoot people doing something. People doing nothing, they're gonna be looking at you. If they're busy doing something else, they can't be bothered to look at you. So if you get yourself into situations where they're wrapped up, in their activity. These guys, what is just what you're looking at here, the young guys have been chewing up this root called kava. I don't know, anybody know of it? Right? It's like a mild, peppery, hallucinogenic, tastes like dirty laundry. And as they chew it up, spit it on a leaf, and then they pour water out, they strain it, it comes out that very appetizing pea soup color at the bottom. You sip those back with the chief and just hang out for a while. You're not doing any motor vehicles or anything with instructions <laughs> for a long time. But the easy thing about working with them is like they're, they're busy. They're busy with a task. Like I had mentioned before with the settings, <clears throat> a lot of people will, they want to work on portraits. And if you consider the viewer and how somebody is going to get to your portraits, it's easier for them to understand something about a person. Say Yasuhiro, the knife guy, right? There were a bunch of other pictures that I took of him because I like to try and get people to the portrait. You know, you can't just have portrait, 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 portrait. Unless you're, you know, Richard Avedon, you're doing portraits, there's a certain expectation that's set. But if you're taking somebody to a place sort of far, far away and you want to give them some information as to how you got there and you're going to get them there too, it's helpful to give these little keys because this reveals something about the people who you're photographing in a way that's distinct to them. Because when you see this, and there's everybody in Tana after the age of five, you get a machete because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of foliage still around, there's no paved roads. 
it's a little off-putting when there's five guys coming down the street with machetes and everybody's waving at you. They're just saying hi. It's, their, it's just the way it is. It takes a little adjusting. But this is the way it's done, and it's a blade. It's not like a, you know, it's a blade that's kind of sharpened to a machete and wrapped at the handle. And you find, like I said, you find the kids coming down the street, and you know, he's got his little brother on his back and the machete, and you know, it's it informs something about the place in a way that if you want to photograph people, remember that they live in a place and they have things. And all of sometimes you'll be amazed that the pictures of the objects and the places may end up being more telling than the portraits themselves. Any questions on that? I don't know how we are on time, but um, any, any questions on that section? Yeah? Linking that one back to the one where you said it's a game of luck and chance, mm -hmm. or just like quickly going through a place, you can't maybe sometimes spend all the time to do that. What's quick? Well, let's say you're three. Riding, like let's say you're riding with people uh -huh. somewhere, and you can't get them to stop the car, so you have to like shoot through the windshield or you know. It depends what you know. If you're with a group, it depends what level of tantrum you're comfortable throwing. <laughs> you can make a really big stink and get out and take the shot. I mean, I. I try to arrange trips and projects in a way that I know I have some space and some time. So that like here it was like three weeks on Tana. So I had like, there, was, there wasn't really uh, a rush per se. But even with that, there were still shots that I, uh, that I saw that I, I know I missed. I wasn't there on the right day. So yeah? This is all available light. I don't think you've seen anything in this that has, uh, you know, any strobes or uh, any additional lighting, or in this case, even reflectors. This is all pretty straight as to, you know, how it is. I try not to shoot between 11 and 3 o'clock, because unless I'm like under an overhang or something. But it's. Uh, you know, especially with the travel work, like it, oh, it can be kind of a lonely game because you're shooting during breakfast and dinner. When everybody else wants to like sit and hang out, you've got to go out shooting because that's when there's decent light. But you can find you can find light all day long. You just kind of go into the shadows and the you know and the really bright sun. This was probably around 6:37 p.m. Um, and it's nice when like an activity like this stuff, this is and this marks end of the day. Like they drink this and this goes into nighttime. So I know that like this one becomes an easy opportunity, you know, to share an example of leaving the camera at home. The day I landed, so flying from New York three days over to Tana, I left the camera at home, took a walk down the beach, and found two women cleaning cow intestines in the tidal pool at sunset. Perfect. There is no record of it at all. So I know that I can go back to Tana just for that. I mean, I know Tom's sister does that like every month and a half, so we can, you know, try and catch it on the next round. But there are plenty, no matter how much time you spend, that like still get missed. Any others? Yeah. So the shot of the two boys with the machete. So is that like you're walking down the road and you're here and kind of stop them and just hold up the camera? Yeah, like they just they like walk all, all the way down. They came out of one of the other uh, one of the other villages, and um, just click bang. That was it. There was another there was another shot. I you know again the, the truth of the image. <clears throat> this kid on the top who looks absolutely terrorized does not have that same expression in the next one. It's a little stronger in this one where I mean. He's looking at like you know some monster with a, you know, with a camera at him, but it's it it definitely changed scene to scene. I just preferred this one better. Thank you. When you're finding your inspiration, this is just a little indicate. Just choose it carefully. I know I said it before. Um, but a lot of people will say like, oh, I want to shoot like so-and-so. And I think like, you don't even have a personality like that. But you'll never shoot like, you're not sort of paired 
with them in a way that it would really work. So find something that kind of, you know, works for you. And if you can't find, like in, in my instance, I didn't find a mentor. I found three because they all didn't do what I, I needed a larger scope than what I was able to find. Um, and they'll help you not make these kind of mistakes and just move through things in a much easier way because they can distill things that you may stumble upon and obsess over for a much longer period of time. This is my drawing instructor. Um, this picture was actually taken by my father. Um, but Myron Barnstone is, has been at the art game for 60 some odd years. He can look at stuff that I've been working on Distill it in an instance. I still use him to bounce projects off to still, you know, to get continuous feedback. Everybody always needs continuous feedback, whether it's other artists, other photographers, mentors. You take whatever you have, but it's, you know, it's useful because they, you know, they'll give you gems like this. And if you read this quote, it puts into perspective a lot of the, you know, the work that we've been looking at. Right, this makes sense. It should all just be one continuous conversation. My other two mentors I don't have pictures of, but one of them I can assure you looks just like Henry VIII. <laughs> Mark's like 6'3", three, three, he did weigh 350 pounds, now he weighs about, I don't know, maybe 270, he lost a bunch of weight. Um, but Mark was my, uh, he was my mentor in construction and the thing that amazed me about him was how easily he was able to work through things, which seemed to me like genius. He assured me it was not genius. It was just that he had made all those mistakes before. And it's easy, if you've made the mistakes before, to see somebody else making them in progress. Usually, I assume this is what our parents watch us go through, and it's torturous because we're busy not listening. The nice thing about a mentor is that they're separated from us in a way that they can look at what we're doing and kind of streamline the work and get you to where you need to be without so many missteps because they already made them. The last one, Fujin Butsudo was, uh, is uh, a Zen monk um, and Fujin's advice is a lot more straightforward. I guess what you would expect from a Zen monk, just do one thing at a time. The scope of what we're talking about is enormous. Pick one. I know I gave seven different points that you could work on, but just start with one so that it's manageable. Trying to do the whole book front to back all at once, it just, it's ineffective, it doesn't work. And this one, you can't read this sign, but it, it says no access. Sometimes the people that you will ask for mentorship from, they may not be willing to give it to you. And they will probably hate me for saying it, but be persistent. There is a certain assurance that you would like if you're going to divulge the information that you've taken years acquiring to somebody else they're, that they're going to stick with it. So oftentimes you will get no's at the beginning. And you will find it. These are four chiefs uh, in Tana and though they don't look like it, they don't wear their ceremonial clothing on a regular day. As you can travel around and find opportunities to introduce yourself to people who have kind of a high level of understanding of whatever it is, whether it's a thing you're into or you're, or you're not, check them out because it's amazing how much you can really learn from them and how like, they're not only excited to get a picture or not excited to get a picture, but I find more often than not, people who've accumulated a certain level of wisdom, they're kind of happy to share it to people who are interested. You know, this is a Titian looking at himself, you know, you want to kind of see how to put images together, you look at how an artist conveys himself, very stoic, very active. You know, it's, it's an easy way to see into their images by looking at how they present themselves. You can go to Saints too, this is Saint Jerome by Caravaggio, and there was a, you know, there was a level of biblical insight that's afforded in these types of pictures and Rembrandt's philosopher. So, you know, the picture, the Japanese image with the light in the background, this is one option. You can do the dark background, nothing else going on. Here's an alternative, just a little bit of context. 
to, keep, to remember those glowing windows as you're working through a scene. This image, which a lot of concerns that I hear are that people are worried about like, well, what if there's no content? What if I'm just taking like pretty pictures on the street? And my feeling is that like content will actually fall in your lap. I was taking a picture of her selling, uh, selling food in Bangkok. And the thing that struck me about Bangkok was the just two totally disconnected societies, you know, contemporary commercial, very mercantile, and they're existing in the same frame. And like, so the girl at the ATM walked into the scene in the background and it's like, I had an idea of what I was looking for in this one, but you just keep it open enough so that you're aware when other things start to creep into the scene and then the content will kind of build itself. Any questions on that? I think we may. Uh, Matt, how are we on time? If it goes over? Do we... Okay. Um, you guys want to go through the last section or questions? Last section. Okay. If you're photographing, in this instance, people, shoot stuff you're into and read about how other people have done it because it will outline some of their frustrations and their successes and failures in a way that you'll say, oh, I did the same thing. Oh, why am I going to do that now? I realized, like, yeah, Rembrandt made the same mistake. I'm not going to do that. Or like Rubens had the same problem. I'm not going to do that. And you can really learn from what they're, you know, what they've already gone through. Um, the, the, the difficult thing when it comes to people, children, scenes that you don't want to disturb, and I think the hardest thing to actually convey to somebody without standing next to them is that when you have a camera in hand, you've got to believe in what you're doing. If there's like a hesitation or a wariness about it, you don't want to be aggressive, but you just want to have a level of confidence that people can feel like, this person knows what they're doing, I'm fine, we don't have to worry about them. And that carries a lot. It's, it's not like a magical trick, but it's like, you know, Practice with what you're doing so that when you show up, if somebody says, what are you doing? You have an answer. You don't just, uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, like, that's not going to instill any confidence in somebody that you're photographing. Overconfidence is a problem also. <laughs> this is Ang doing Napoleon. I think this is a young artist doing a young monarch, and the combination of the two is catastrophic. When Ang gets into his later portion of his career, I think he really finds a better stride. And this, this piece you can see at the Frick, you can't photograph because they won't let any of us take pictures in there. But there's a stark contrast in the initial assertion of I'm going to be a painter, I am going to be a king, and I'm a painter. I'm not worried about it. You're not worried about it. In fact, you'd probably like me to come paint your picture. And that comes through, I think, a lot better in this. This may be weird for a photographic talk, but don't limit your mediums. This is Boccioni, who also does this. He was a painter, an Italian futurist, obsessed with war, machines, destroying museums and libraries. Thank God he didn't. He fell off a horse and died in the war, not in battle, just fell off rather anticlimactically. Um, but he went between sculpture and painting rather well. So sometimes you might hit a wall in photography where actually you're not making a photograph. You're entering into a different realm. And I would say, like, go for it. There are a lot of artists who've worked in multiple mediums. And if you reach that zone, you don't have to stay in photography. You can explore things beyond photo, painting, you know, sculpture, however it plays itself out. You know, and you photograph things you're interested in. Funny Van Gogh came up today. Sometimes we want to see into the mind of an artist. Other times we don't. We'd rather not see what's going on inside there, and we'd just rather let that be. He had his up days and his down days, and painting sunflowers or prisons is, becomes kind of clear where his mental stability was at when he was doing it. If I could take credit for encouraging only one thing from this talk, it would be that the next time you get into a conversation about photography, please don't start it with, I like and I don't like. 
when we talk about work, we want to talk about what photographs are doing. They're like verbs. They, they do things. They're active and they're engaging. We don't want to just say, oh, I like that. I don't like that. I'm sure, put pictures on a forum. You get a bunch of, I like that. Great, awesome, spectacular, horrible, throw yourself off a bridge, never take a picture again. You know, you get the range, but it doesn't really help you. And one of the th ways in which you can help other photographers is to let them know what the pictures are doing. Because when we get into the likes, I like sailboats. So anything nautical, I'm just going to like. So me saying this picture by Corot, I like it, it doesn't do anything for any of you. Hopefully the earlier part of the presentation would have done something more. But that's why I'd like to just temper the like, don't like thing. And look outside the people. We looked at people, we looked at paintings, but you know, there are opportunities beyond just the portrait that you'll be able to do. And sometimes you may enter into a scene photographing the architecture first. That may be the thing that gets you up there. Somebody sees a picture of architecture that you like and they say, oh, can you take my picture? Would you take this? So it opens up a lot of doors. And I, you know, my encouragement is to photograph things you like. I, happen, I have a background in building and in sculpture, so I like objects. I like architecture. And I like these, these things. They're revealing. These are Yasuhiro's sandals in his, in his studio. And above all, I like learning. This is his apprentice. He's a 23-year-old French apprentice working for a 64-year-old, 60, you know, fifth-generation master metalsmith. And this, to me, is interesting, because I'm going to see Eric over the course of a number of years and watch that develop. And that's an opportunity, I think, that I wouldn't want to miss. So from the, you know, old, young, young, old, I mean, interchangeably, there's something to be gained all the way around. Um, he harvests tea outside of Kyoto. They've been doing imperial tea for, I think, over 300 years. Works with his son and credits his good health to drinking lots of green tea and working all the time. <laughs> At the end, I think a lot of this and the developments that will occur won't actually happen with the camera in hand. This is something, this is kind of a process that we have internally, a dialogue that we have with each other, and the camera is just the confirmation that you got it. When you get it, the camera registers it. When you're learning it, it still comes out kind of confused. Um, I had the opportunity to spend some time with uh, Taka in his family's monastery. And you, know, you really have a chance to put yourself in a historical context. And, res and I, you, know, you have the sense that you inherit a lot from what came before you. And the future generations will look to what you've done as to how to continue along the way. And that's fairly important. So I want to thank you guys. I know we kind of ran over a little bit. Um. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.